Cheers, yeah, thank you. Uh, you wait, it's uh, 55 minutes. You want uh, 55 minutes? Yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've kind of yeah. timed it for about 45. Okay. Or well, I've timed yeah, it, but yeah, I'm going to yeah. try and guess. Uh, oh, Q, oh, is it Q&A? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I'll, I'll punch it to you if, okay. if you want. But yeah. uh, would, would you like someone to hold up a time frame five minutes? No, I've got, I've got, I've got, I'll, I'll go okay, by that. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, that'll be fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leonardo. Uh, up next, we have Stuart Newstead talking about wireless cloud computing. If it's a sustainable superhero or a carbon criminal. Stuart, over to you. Cheers. Thanks very much, Andrew. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I never thought I'd play a live gig at the O2, so it's fantastic to be here this afternoon. Um, as it says up here on the slide, this is the only slide we're going to have the afternoon. My name is Stuart Newstead. I run a consultancy called El Air. Uh, El Air, very high tech name. My children are called Elliot and Claire. So it puts the two of them together, you get El Air. I've done that for about 10 years, to, oh no, 11 years since 2002. Before that, I used to work at O2. Um, I was a vice president of business products and um, had a great time there. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about the green tech credentials of the wireless cloud. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about what the wireless cloud means. I'm going to talk use some terms, some te techniques from economics. So we have any economists here amongst you? Anybody who claims to know anything about economics? That's good. I'm fairly safe on that. OK. And I'm going to talk a little bit about physics. So anybody here know about physics? OK. You better keep me tight on the physics. And we're going to talk a little bit about cycling. So is anybody? Okay, excellent. Excellent. Loads, right, loads of cyclists. That's really good. So keep that in mind. Now. Over the last 10 or 11 years, I've had quite a wide range of clients. Uh, this, actually, this talk come out of some work that was commissioned just recently by The Guardian, which is a, a UK national newspaper. We wrote an article for their sustainable business uh, piece about this very topic. And so this talk has really come out of that. I'll give you the link at the end of the talk, so if you want to go and read it, just to check I'm saying the same thing. Um, many other clients, so the, the electricity regulator here in the UK, We've done work for some uh, venture capital uh, funds, done work for various charities, done work for many telecoms operators. And for those of you who know the world, we've done work in over 20 countries. Um, so anywhere as exotic as the Seychelles, done work there, fantastic, Sri Lanka. And then in England, Skelmersdale, which is a very sort of small, boring town. So we kind of covered the globe. Now, what I'm going to cover is this topic, sustainable superhero. So is the wireless cloud good for the planet, or is it a carbon criminal? Is it actually putting far more CO2 emissions into the Earth's atmosphere than it is taking out? And we could do that a little bit about, first of all, describing what we mean by wireless cloud computing. I'm going to talk about some of the assumptions that have been made up to now about the wireless cloud, some recent research that maybe changes those assumptions, and I'm going to explain why these differences come about. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about the benefits that are coming from wireless cloud computing, which you might have seen some. And also, I'd like to get towards the end by talking about what, so what for you Camposeros? What's it all going to mean? Why would you find it important? Why would you find it relevant for your jobs, for your own careers, and for your interests? And we hope there's a little bit of time left for questions. Now, we're in what I think of as the perfect digital storm. And I don't just mean that you can hear speeches from both sides of you at the same time. What I mean by that is probably three things. Just at Leo, in the last talk, was just touching on at the end. We've got three things that have come together digitally. We've got more and more and more powerful smartphones and tablets. We've got more powerful, more ubiquitous uh, everywhere and faster mobile networks. And we've got more and more powerful data centers where you can store and process digital information. You stick all those together, and they create the perfect storm for a wireless cloud, a world of the wireless cloud. So in principle, all, you know, all our games, videos, uh, tweets, social feeds, even business information can sit in an efficient center somewhere, and then we can just access it when we want. And it all sounds great. And so, so this is the wireless cloud. 
one way of thinking about it is quite well described by Google. And they say, for Google Drive, Google Drive is everywhere you are, on the web, in your home, at the office, and on the go. So wherever you are, your stuff is just there, ready to go and ready to share. And this, this wireless cloud is of great interest to many companies. You might have come across, for example, Amazon Web Services, Apple iCloud, Microsoft Office 365, not to mention things like Dropbox, Facebook, but also Baidu, Weixin, the Chinese companies very interested in wireless cloud as well. And not just, not just those kind of digital names, the more traditional mobile networks. Think of the likes of what Vodafone are doing, what Telefonica here are doing, and what AT&T or China Mobile are doing, trying to make sure that the connectivity is seen as the most valuable part of this wireless cloud. Just this morning, you'll have seen Microsoft taking over Nokia mobile phones. Microsoft's latest attempt, probably doomed to failure yet again, to get into mobile in a really big way. They've always sort of struggled a bit on mobile ever since I, f I go back to, oh, around about 2000 when they first started talking to me when I was at O2 about mobile and almost having the same, they're almost having the same conversation today. So, so if there's somebody from Microsoft, I'd love to hear differently, but there's a challenge. But another brand that's trying to get into this wireless cloud in the same way as like a Samsung are, trying to make the device the dominant part of what is happening. So, wireless cloud, data center, connectivity, device, and then applications to bring it all together. And that's primarily what we're, what we're going to talk about. So that's just a brief definition of what we mean. When, um, it's great to be here. This, this, this time last year, this venue was called the North Greenwich Arena. Uh, do we know why, why was it called the North Greenwich Arena? Was anybody here this time last year? It was in the London Olympics. Because of the branding power of, uh, of the, um, the uh, International Olympic Committee, O2 was not allowed to call it the O2. So for the duration of the Olympics and then the Paralympics, it became the North Greenwich Arena. Now, up for the couple of years before that, uh, I was chair of one of the Olympics committees, very fortunately. It was to, do, to work out, make sure that the mobile experience was going to be good throughout the whole Olympics, be it on 3G, be it on Wi-Fi, be it whatever. And so we saw some amazing statistics of growth of this sharing of information, sharing of data, and the wireless cloud. For example, just, I'm just going to give you one. Because today, I'm going to try and steer as clear as I can away from statistics and try and paint more of a, a wider picture. But on the first weekend of the Olympics, in London, there was more, de more mobile data sent than in the whole of the FIFA World Cup in 2010. So just two years before, a whole month's worth of football, I can see all, the, all you ladies just delighted at that thought of a month's worth of football, and in one weekend at the Olympics, there was more mobile data sent just two years later. So it gives you some idea of the growth. I've, you know, we've, a number of us here, so I see some of my former colleagues here today, We've dealt with, and I'm sure you have as well, come through quite a few false dawns when it comes to, to the mobile world. We've seen like dot .com, dot .mobi, mobile crashes, 3G launches, but this one just seems to be for real. It's not going to go away for the reasons I mentioned. You've got the, 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 um, the data center, the connectivity, the device, the application underpinning it all. It's not going to go away. So question then is, we can see the growth benefit, absolutely, no doubt about it. But the question for today is, is it a sustainable superhero? We're here talking about green tech. Is it good for the planet? The working assumption, what I call the received wisdom, so something that's assumed to be true, is that it is. And the argument goes something like this. Well, it says, well, if you have wireless cloud, then you don't have to travel places. You can just communicate, you can have mobile conferencing, you can have collaboration tools, you can share information, share videos with your friends, you can share concert info, whatever it might be. You can even watch concerts remotely, watch TV remotely. Thing two then says, if you have all the information being processed in a big data center somewhere in the desert in Arizona, that processing is a lot more efficient than having millions of computers, millions of individual computers doing the processing. So you have an efficiency argument comes through as well. Then the third thing 
is a flexibility argument, which says if you have smartphones and tablets, then because you can process information when you want, or access information when you want, it makes you more efficient. You then don't go on un un unnecessary travels, don't do unnecessary work, don't leave PCs on unnecessarily. And so the carbon footprint of the wireless cloud is a good thing. And there are some good reports about this. Again, at the end, if you want, I can give you some uh, good links to these. There was a good report. I know we're at a Telefonica event. There was a good report by Vodafone and Accenture a couple of years ago about the, about the carbon, uh, carbon world of 2020. What, and we're gonna, I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get on to some of the benefits. So there is some good analysis around to try and underpin these assumptions about it, that, I, that wireless cloud is a good thing for green tech. There is, there's a, a good Greenpeace uh, report that asking how clean is your cloud, looking at the data centers and how they're powered. But the generally is quite good analysis, and therefore the received wisdom is that the wireless cloud is a good thing for the planet. Till now. Now earlier this year, a there's a, a group I've got, to read, I've got to remember what they call the Center for Energy Efficient Telecommunications. I'm calling them CEET, C -E -E -T, CEET for short. They're in Melbourne, Australia. And they produced a report called The Power of the Wireless Cloud. And what they said was that they looked beyond just the data centers. They said up to now, people have concentrated on the data center as being the source of carbon emissions. But they haven't taken enough into account the mobile networks and the devices. So if you think about it, Wireless cloud starts with a device. You then have, here we are, put it into action, a base station or antenna or a router. You then have a backhaul network. And then you have a data center. So there's more elements to take into account than you might first think. And through their calculations, and they, they deliberately put the paper out as a bit of a discussion document, so you can argue with some of the assumptions. But they're working, they're, so when they broke it down, they found that the wireless network especially the routers, like the Wi-Fi routers that sit in our homes and in hotspots like this, or the mobile base stations, the antennas that again sit in place like this or sit out on the streets and by the roads, they account for about nine tons in every 10 of carbon caused by the wireless cloud. The data center is only about 10%. So all the previous analysis, which are really concentrating the data center, was massively undercalling the impact, the carbon impact of the wireless cloud. And so they really sort of undermined, not undermined, but they started to question in a big way the received wisdom that said, oh yes, wireless cloud is a good thing for the planet, it is a sustainable superhero. They started to say, maybe it is a carbon criminal after all. If not a full criminal, maybe a bit of petty crime, a bit of shoplifting, if not a mass murderer yet. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is explain to you what's caused, what's brought about those differences. And this is where we're going to bring our experts into play. And we're going to talk about the economics, we're going to talk about some physics, and we're going to talk about some cycling. OK? And I hope that that's going to explain how it's going to work. So let's start with the economics. Now, the, a few people have joined and left. Can I just check? Is there any economists here? OK, good. That's all right. That's fine. That's good. Actually, in these, with the economy as it is, nobody's going to admit to being an economist anyway. So that's, that's fine. Now, one of the things that we really, really value is the ability to get information. We value that almost as much as actually when we get information. So the fact that our phones are on and we can just press a button and get something, we value that. In eco and that's separate from what we value when we actually get the information, be it a tweet, be it a Facebook uh, photo, an update, be it an email, or business information, whatever it might be. And economics, that's called an option, as opposed to the actual consumption. Okay? The consumption is when we're actually reading it, getting value, streaming, sharing, whatever it might be. The option is the ability to get it. And almost by definition, think of the words always on, always connected, that is stressing the option to consume rather than the consumption itself. And what the seat paper pointed out is that the networks and the routers and the devices, because they're always on, they're spending a lot of time in standby, 
they, they are costing, that option to consume is costing an awful lot of the carbon that is coming through. So the actual consumption is a relatively smaller part. So from their calculation, about one, one ton in 10, about one tenth. Whereas the option, the, our, the value we are putting on, the device is always being on, the route is always being on, the network's always being on, is costing about nine tons out of 10. And what they estimated, the seat guys, was that between now and 2015, that option, that extra, could cost the carbon equivalent of about five million new cars. So five million new cars for us to have the ability to be one button press away from getting hold of information that we want. So it's quite a big price to pay for, for having something available as opposed to having it actually ready for us to use. So that's a bit about the economics. I'm going to do the cycling next. So can I, the cyclists put their hand up again? The cyclists put their hand up. Eh, everybody's a cyclist. I'm a cyclist as well. Um, OK, how many, I don't know which countries you all come from. How many of you have heard of a guy called Sir Dave Brailsford? Sir Dave Brailsford. OK, now mind, he is the head of the Team Sky cycling team and the Team GB cycling team. And, what, and he's, he's now a Sir Dave because he did so well in the Olympics and in the tour, for the tour, managing the Tour de France. OK, so if you keep cycling, especially you, sir, you look like a good cyclist to me. You're in the white shirt. A, a knighthood could be on your way from the Queen. OK, yes, yeah, you, don't, you. OK, don't look away yet. OK, now, what Sir Dave Railsford articulated was a strategy, and he calls it the aggregation of marginal gains. And what he said was, too often in cycling, traditionally, people just look at the big things. They pay, they find a superstar rider, they pay a lot of money for him, and then he rides. Or they look at the yellow jersey, say, we'll have that, we'll keep it, we'll focus all our resource on our best guy to get that, and that's it. What he said was that there's a lot more science and a lot more detail that matters in this. And he said, we at Sky, start of a team Sky, are going to look at every minute aspect of cycling performance. Right down to, in Team Sky, when they go are doing a race somewhere, they take their own sheets and pillows to the hotel because they know that you like a different pillow to you and you like a different sheet to you. So they take their own. So they think that if you get a five minutes better sleep than one of your competitors, you will do better. It's that amount of detail. So they will look at the aerodynamics not of my head, that's quite aerodynamic, my head, but of, the, of Sir Bradley Wiggins' cycling helmet. And if they can make that one thousandth of a percent better than it was the day before, they can maybe increase his speed by, say, a hundredth of a mile an hour. And that could end up, add those together, 20, 30, 40 of those different aspects of performance, and all of a sudden you're talking about a yellow jersey or a gold medal, very visible, as opposed to just being a loser. So the aggregation of marginal gains. Now, why is that relevant to us? Well, when people have been counting data centers, they're quite easy to count because they're big and there's not many of them. And you go around and say, there's one, there's one, there's one, and you can count up the carbon that they're contributing. But when you have millions of routers, millions of base stations, billions of phones, there are seven billion, by, by this time next year, there'll probably be seven billion mobile subscriptions on this planet. So what you find is that, you, because that they, they, they're there all around us, we tend not to count them. So this is the, where the cycling comes in. Most, up to now, most analysis has missed the aggregation of marginal gains. And secondly, there's another factor, which is what brings us neatly on to the physics. So we're science players. Who, who, who put their hands up of being physicists? Great stuff, thank you. Um, have you heard of the words centripetal and centrifugal? Okay, that's all right. Will you come and give the talk? Is that okay? No, okay, all right. Okay, all right. In, in physics, centripetal forces are like, they bring things together. They pull, they're centralizing. They pull things together. Be like a sort of gravity. And a data center, you can think of as having a centripetal effect on the carbon emission. It's centralizing it, making it more efficient make it better in that sense. So from a carbon perspective, getting things more centripetal 
is better. You can control, they, they're more efficient in the way they consume electricity. They're, more, they're easier to use in the way they, gen they actually, you can use solar power to, uh, to power them. But I've mentioned already the millions of routers, the billions of mobile phones, the millions of antennas. That's like a centrifugal effect, which is like a dispersing, a fragmenting effect going out. And what's happening there, that's, that's introducing dis, dis economy or it's introducing inefficiency in the carbon. It's also making a lot of the devices, it means a lot of the devices that are used in this wireless cloud are battery powered. Okay, I've come to look, I live in Oxford in England, it's about an hour on the train from here. For today, I've brought with me, just a regular day, it's only, I only thought about this half an hour ago, I have brought four battery powered devices with me today. So I've got a smartphone, I've got an iPad, I've got a personal uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, and I've got a Bluetooth headset. So four devices that need battery power. So it has to be recharged all the time. So they're not centralized, it's dispersing. Instead of just one thing, I've actually got four. So the physics is saying that we've got this counterbalance, these two counterbalancing uh, events. One is the centralizing, this centripetal activity, and the other is the dispersing, the centrifugal activity. And it's those, if we bring those together, the economics, the physics, and the cycling, we start to see why it is that the seat paper started to question the sustainable superhero and start to move him towards being a carbon criminal. So, despite the massive growth in usage of smartphones and tablets, what we're actually seeing is that maybe an even more rapid growth in the carbon emissions. So it really put calls into question some of the traditional assumptions about the wireless cloud. But it's not all negative, and I think it's important, I want to, want to do at this point, is to start painting some of the benefits of the wireless cloud. As we talked about our five million new cars, the question is also, well, how many cars are being saved, or some equivalent measure, from the benefits of the wireless cloud? And I'm going to try and keep away, again, as I said, from stats, because they can get a bit overwhelming very quickly when you talk about megatons of CO2, or you talk about exabytes of data, like, which is mega, mega, megabytes of data. It just, we, it's, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. We kind of lose track of it. Now, so clearly there are, you know, I mentioned this ability, this 20, always on, always connected, 24 by 7 access that we have. And there are clearly some benefits. And I mentioned the, um, the Vodafone Accenture report that came out, and they were just looking at the business benefits from wireless cloud. And they looked at a few different areas, and I just want to label them for you. Some of the terms aren't, aren't very good, but they, um, they call it, I'll explain them in a second. So dematerialization, not the world's best word. Smart grid, smart logistics, smart cities, and smart manufacturing. And what they were saying, we should probably what comes in for the kind of work that you do, is dematerialization. What that means is instead of travel, or instead of atoms being generated, you turn it into wireless cloud. So instead of traveling, you have, say, mobile presence. So I could have, another day, I could maybe sit at my office back in Oxford and give the talk from there. And I'll talk in a few minutes what, what this e-campus e what this campus party might look like in a couple of years' time. But we've all traveled here to be here today. It may or may not be the best way that we could have done this. We've got the smart grid, which you might have heard of. Uh, for example, in the UK, all homes are going to have what's called smart meters to measure electricity and manage electricity in the home by 2020. Uh, and the smart grid is all about how you man monitor and manage flows of energy, especially el electricity. So rather than having to have massive peaks that you have to plan for, you can try and spread the peaks out and manage the load across the networks using communications, using ICT to help that. Smart logistics, which is all about if you're a fleet manager, and if some of you work in, say, enterprise sales, your customers are fleets of trucks, like Eddie Stober, Norbert Dontresongle, people like that. What you can use is you can embed mobile technology into the vehicles, into the trucks, into the refrigeration units, into the vending machines to manage them so they can say, all right, I can schedule my routing better. I can, I can cause uh, less diesel, less petrol to be used on my roads than currently is the case. Smart cities, 
It's all about the actual, uh, uh, your pre Leo mentioned Barcelona, a good example, where you're trying to use technology to manage, for example, congestion, try and manage the street lights uh, better, manage the, sorry, manage, I meant the traffic lights better, also manage things like street lights more efficiently, manage lighting, manage congestion, manage traffic flows. And then smart, manuf smart, legit smart manufacturing is all about using Im the um, what's called embedded mobiles into the actual units themselves, so that you can track them as they go through a factory, and you can track them as they as they go through their life, and, and manage them uh, manage them a lot more carefully. So you can, but those things I've described, nearly all the benefits come from the actual consumption of data rather than the actual always on. So again, it's a reinforcement of the seat paper, which is that the consumption is good, the always on is not necessarily so good. And we need to think about a different way of doing that. So just, it's just one minute, well, one half minute on numbers. The Vodafone report maybe said that he, it thought that maybe the benefits to the European Union would be about 113 megatons. The seat report talks about extra cost of maybe 35, 37 megatons. So maybe the net benefit might be OK. But there's a big danger that we are undercalling the costs of that. So I'm just going to bring this together a little bit at, towards the end, to save ourselves a little bit of time, and try and work out, so what? You're, as Campus Eros here, which I think is the collective noun for anybody who's come to this event, how can it help you? Now, I looked at the Campus Party website, tried to see what the event was about. And what it says is, it's to promote digital skills, help transform ideas into reality, and support, support employment across Europe. Um, so I was trying to think, well, what, how might this help you? How might thinking about wireless cloud computing, is it a sustainable superhero or a carbon criminal? How might that help you? in your job, in your prospects, in the work that you do, in opportunities that you might see. Um, there was a famous song written in the 1940s, uh, which has been recorded by many people ever since, called Accentuate the Positive, Eliminate the Negative. So I thought that would be a good couple of good headings to use. And I've just thought of, I tried to think of a few um, possible things for you to think about and take away. So firstly, Accentuate the Positive, which is all about the benefits how can we get more benefits from using wireless cloud computing than we are currently doing? And it seems to me there's th maybe three possible things to think about. One is just, we've talked all the time about energy consumption. We haven't talked so much about energy generation. It seems to be getting greener energy. The more we can do to get greener energy and manage that greener energy into the national and local grids, the better. So if you're working anything close to the energy sector, that would seem to be the area to go down and to have a look at. The second one, which is an acceleration of what's happening now, is to, that, to integrate far more closely the embedded devices, that's what I call, where you embed a chip, a mobile chip, into a device and make that far more part of mainstream business processes. It's OK, but it's still quite early days for that. The quicker and more uh, extensively that embedded mobile devices can embed themselves into the crucial business processes, the better. And the third thing is more for the organizers of this event. I kind of touched on it a, a second ago. This is a technology-based event, trying to show the best, the best that technology can offer. Probably one year's time is probably too soon. But I just wonder whether Campus Party in 2015 might be e-Campus Party, and it's all done virtually, and it saves everybody the travel. Save, save every living in a tent for a week, and save huge amounts of carbon that's going to get us all here. So that's a couple of, of two or three accentuate the positives. And there are a few eliminate the negatives as well. So I think the biggest thing for me is that's come out of this research I've been doing and the, and the stuff with The Guardian is the we do need to start questioning what always on actually means and whether we can replace that by always nearly on or always nearly available, which seems to me to talk about how devices and routers might want to hibernate more quickly and go into a deeper hibernation and then come back more quickly rather than being on but the standby level being too high a power consumption. Because most of the time, 
Most of the time, like it or not, the devices and the routers are in standby mode. They're not doing anything. They're just waiting for action. It's a bit like um, there's a good definition of war. The definition of war is it's long periods of intense boredom interspersed, interspersed by very short bits of massive excitement. So most of the time, if you're a mobile device or a mobile router, that's your life. You're not doing much, and then all of a sudden stuff happens, and you have loads of megabits per second. The second one is a fair, yeah, almost a fairly obvious one, which is I've mentioned that we've got, I've brought today four devices that are battery powered. Improve battery technology. Improve the battery technology, improve the charging, improve the life, improve the efficiency, improve the efficiency of manufactured batteries. Related to that is we need to think, move far more quickly and, and, and strongly towards using solar power or things like kinetic power, shaking your, your wrist, shaking your hand, to recharge batteries. So re battery recharging in a far more efficient, a far, more, a far less carbon intensive way than now. One thing that's happening more, which is happening more, is use the assets better. So more and more mobile network sharing. Thankfully, regulators, well, certainly in the Western world, I'd like to see it far more in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, start to share networks more. So you get more efficiency. So instead of the networks being sitting in standby mode, they're actually in active mode more of the time. Finally, I don't know how many of you got, oh, I, I should have asked at the beginning how many of you have got a, ma a maths background. So that's me, I've got a maths background. I do think we need to count, count the carbon more explicitly. This is a, this is a very a big area of, of kind of confusion, and it's quite hard to count the lifetime carbon of something. But I just think we need to get a lot more explicit about counting all the carbon that's involved in the process. And this is what the Melbourne paper has really done, is highlight there's a lot more carbon to be counted than we've previously thought to be the case. Lastly, switch off your mobile phone and switch off your router at night. A really thing that we can all do. And one thing that since I actually started work, I've started to do myself. Uh, and also, tell your local coffee shop that when they close, they should switch off their router as well. Because obviously, they're not going to be having any customers at night. So, just to bring it all together, answer my own question, or talk, ex answer the exam question. Is the wireless cloud computing a sustainable superhero? Certainly not yet, but it does have some potential. On the flip side, is it a carbon criminal? Probably also not yet, but I think it's fair to say that it's, some, it's like a teenager who's doing a lot of things that its parent doesn't know about. Okay? And it has the potential to, if it does that, it might, it might move towards criminality. And on, on that basis, I'll draw to a conclusion. More than happy to take any questions that you might have. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, I think we, we probably have a lady with it. If any of you has a question, otherwise we can just sort of move on and get a cup of coffee. Yeah, lady at the back. Can you, can, can you just come a bit? I don't know if I'll be able to hear you. Can you just come a bit forwards? It's, uh, we've got sort of things on over here. Um, That's okay. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you think that um, large corporations and new businesses um, are taking into account enough the kind of environmental issues when setting up or when developing their large corporations. Okay, I think... I think um, some, like anything else, there's a big spectrum, and I think some of the companies, you would be surprised at how committed they are. I think a good example is, is Sky. So Sky is completely committed to being carbon neutral. Actually, Telefonica as well. So I think there's a lot of commitment. And there's also, um, so like so Telefonica, and it's, I'm not, you know, I'm independent, I'm not promoting Telefonica, I'm just using them as an example. They're good at trying to be carbon neutral themselves, and also to work out how that plays into what they are selling and how they sell it. But equally, I think there's, particularly now, the last few years since 2008, when the economy has been bad, I think that environmental uh, effects have been relegated further down the priority list. And I think it's far too easy to say, oh, no, we won't worry about that. One of the things that really surprises me as a, as a, as a parent, you know, as all, most, a lot of people here are parents, is people will do all kinds of things to get their kids into good school, saying, oh, I'm, look, I'm trying to look after my child's future. But then they'll, they'll take their, their kid to school in a, in a Chelsea tractor, four by four, and they're, they're screwing up their child's life chances further down the line. I just don't, you know, but we're, as humans, we're quite good at holding two opposing thoughts. I think that's the case there. Okay, so, so some yes, and some surprising yes, and some not, you know, some not so yes. Okay, to be fair, I think the airlines are, not, are trying very hard. Um, in fact, I think the next talk is about um, Airbuses and stuff like that. That may be a question there. Okay, okay, do, uh, yep, there's a gentleman there. Um, I was just wondering um, how it was that they calculated the kind of nine tons out of ten being due to opportunity cost. Okay, yep, certainly. Um, 
what they did was where, where they could identify, say, an individual device. So that's just you know, about X three watts or something like that, okay, that you can, you can identify the power consumption of a, of a device. What they then tried to do is, when it was a shared device, they looked at, um, the, they basically shared it across the expected um, flow of traffic over the network through that device, and then looked at sort of, they actually looked at micro bits per joule. So they, they worked out a shared thing, and then, then they added them all up and tried to get them into kilowatt hours or terawatt hours. So they sort of, depending on whether the device was unique, which is really the mobile device, or shared, then they, 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 you know, they used either the watts or the micro bits per joule and then added them all up at the end. Okay? And you can argue, I've got to say, the, the, uh, the seat one is a really good report, but it's not, it's not Bible. I, see, I, I don't think they've taken into account enough about things like network sharing or the possibility of caching information in base stations you're closer to the customer. But as a starting point, you get people thinking about it, I think it's really good. Yeah. Okay? Uh, yep, yep, sir. Uh, the other question would be, uh, new, new technologies like 4G, do you, are they more efficient or less than the current? They're, they're, bo <laughs> they're both. They're both. Because um, their capacity of a base station is a lot higher, but their power consumption is also higher. And also, there's a lot more of them. There's a lot more of them, you know. So because they, uh, because our volumes have gone up so much, you have to use a lot more uh, stations. So each one might be more efficient, but there's just more of them. So back to my point of earlier about you have to count, you have to count them all, and it's easier rather, rather than saying, oh, it's more per unit, it's more efficient. Okay, that's the big that's the big thing about 4G. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, so, well, thank you very much for your attention. If any of you like either any of the links I've spoken about, then just come and just come and ask me. But thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the show. Okay, thank you.